Uh, good morning. My name is Guy Kawasaki, and I am from Silicon Valley, California, San Francisco, California. And I am here today uh, to talk to you about innovation. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I worked for Apple from 1983 to 1987. I was Apple's software evangelist. How many of you use any Apple products? Oh, lots of you. Wow. I knew I liked this country. Uh, so I worked for the Macintosh division, which was uh, the private division of Steve Jobs, if you will. And uh, because we worked for Steve Jobs, we had very special rules. We had unlimited supplies of fresh orange juice at uh, $3 a bottle. We had a travel policy, which was that we could fly first class for any flight over two hours. And uh, my interpretation of that rule was the two hours begins at the moment you leave your apartment, so I flew first class every year for years. Uh, back then, Apple had the Apple II division, which was making all the money, and the Macintosh division, which was spending all the money, because the Apple II was shipping and the Macintosh was not. Uh, but the Macintosh division people were such bad people, we were such arrogant, ego, egomaniac people, that we would not let Apple II people into the Macintosh building. And uh, if you think about it, the Apple II people were paying for the building they were not being allowed into. So that upset them a lot, and they came up with a great joke about us, which is how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, the answer is one. The Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around him. Uh, after the Macintosh division, I started several software companies. I became a writer and a speaker. I returned to Apple in 1995 as Apple's chief evangelist, and then I left again to start an early stage venture capital firm called Garage.com. Uh, however, I'm really not here to talk about uh, my profession as much as the art of innovation. Uh, but before I start about talking about the art of innovation, uh, this is my first trip to the Gulf at all. And so I've been here two days now, and I've had a truly wonderful time. Uh, it is a little warmer than Silicon Valley, I must admit. But I've had a truly great time. And so sometimes when I travel to a country that I've never visited, uh, I like to show pictures of what I've done in your country. So if you'll indulge me. Um, yesterday, I had a really great time because I went to Al Jazeera. And uh, I'm really impressed with what they do. I love their news coverage. So I, ha I had a wonderful time at Al Jazeera. That's me standing in front of the sign at Al Jazeera. And uh, this is, I learned, this is where Al Jazeera started. That's the first room where the reporters worked. And then this is the social media team of Al Jazeera. So they're very active on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, they, all, they all use Macintoshes, which right there, I felt right at home. So I had a great time at Al Jazeera. And uh, then I went to the Museum of Islamic Art. And I have been to museums all over the world, but I have never seen a museum like that museum. It's truly a remarkable museum. And uh, this is uh, th just the sheer beauty of each room, just the architecture and the lighting and the materials that's used. I was just totally, totally impressed with this museum. I, I have to bring my wife back here to see this museum. She would love this museum. And... Uh, this is a picture from the gift shop. So even the gift shop of your museum is beautiful. And that cannot be said about most museums around the world. Uh, you know, is it possible to make the stage darker so that the, the slides are easier to see, whoever is controlling light? Well, OK. And uh, then I'll show you some architecture that I saw in your city. I've never seen a building like this. This is a very interesting building. It sort of shimmers, even though <laughs> it's not moving. Very interesting building. I love this building. And uh, this was also an interesting experience. I've never seen anything like that. This is like the ultimate high-rise for pigeons I saw. Uh, but my favorite building in all of Doha has to be this building. Uh, I've never seen a building like this. There's no such building like this in America. And uh, this is truly unique architecture. And then we went to the seafood restaurant, and I had wonderful seafood. And I met all these women entrepreneurs. Uh, there were like a lot of women entrepreneurs in Doha. I was really, really touched to meet them. Uh, they're very, very bright and very entrepreneurial. 
And uh, I have to tell you a funny story. So this is the waitress at that restaurant. And so this waitress comes up to me, and she says, can I take a picture with you after you eat? And I said to her, how do you know who I am? And she said, I've seen you in the movies. <laughs> so, so I said to her, oh, so you've seen my speeches on YouTube. She goes, no, I've seen you in all your movies. Aren't you Jackie Chan? <laughs> so she thought I was Jackie Chan. And so that, that was kind of the high point of uh, my trip here. Um, I, I could tell you another funny story. I have a lot of funny Jackie Chan stories. Uh, about 10 years ago, in the height of the dot-com days in Silicon Valley, I used to drive a Porsche 911. And so one day, I'm at a stop sign in California, and this car full of teenage girls next to me stops. And they all start looking at me, laughing and smiling, and one girl says, roll down your window. So I roll down the window, and this girl, and I'm thinking, finally I have arrived. You know, even teenage girls know who I am because of my work at Apple, because of my writing and my speaking. I truly have arrived in the world. And she says to me, are you Jackie Chan? <laughs> and so now, you know, everybody needs goals. One of the things you should learn about entrepreneurship is you need goals in life. So my goal in life is that someday Jackie Chan is at a seafood restaurant in Doha, or Jackie Chan is driving his Rolls Royce in Hong Kong, and a car full of teenage girls asks Jackie Chan, are you Guy Kawasaki? <laughs> so, um, and this is my final slide. Uh, you may find this hard to believe, but I love ice hockey. And I found out that you have a rink at the Villaggio. And then I found out that people play hockey at the Villaggio in 104 degree weather. So I brought all my stuff, and these are five uh, people, uh, Qatarians, who play hockey. So that was the highlight of my night last night. I played hockey in the desert. It was, and I told all my friends in California, and they're all just totally impressed that I could do this. I had a great time. This is great, great fun. So those are my pictures uh, from my 20, first 24 hours in your city. I've had a great time. Thank you very much. Uh, I learned that it's really hot here, and you're really nice people, and you eat very well here. This is, this is and you have hockey. I should move here. I just love this country. So uh, this is my little photo essay about being in Doha. Um, let me talk to you about innovation. Now, I have been in the technology business for about 25 years now, so I've watched many American CEOs speak. And I'll tell you the two key points about most American CEOs, CXO, CIO, CTO. The two key points about their speaking. First, they're lousy speakers, and second, they go long. And that is a bad combination because if you are lousy and you are short, it's okay. And if you're great and you go long, it's okay. But if you're lousy and you go long, it's a bad combination. It's like being stupid and arrogant at the same time. And so what I've done is I always use the top 10 format for my speeches so that in case you think I'm lousy, at least you know about how much longer I'll be lousy. I have 10 points for you today. So the first point of innovation is that great innovation happens when you have a desire to make meaning, that is to change the world, to make the world a better place. And if you look at the great tech successes of Silicon Valley, every one of them wanted to make the world a better place. Apple Computer wanted to make people more creative and more productive. YouTube wanted to make people have more fun by sharing video. Facebook was to be more social. Uh, Google was to have a better search to democratize information. And what I've noticed as an investor, as an entrepreneur, is that great companies start off with the desire to make meaning, not simply to make money. And I'm going to give you an example of a great, great desire to make meaning. Let me read to you this advertising. A woman is often measured by the things she cannot control. She is measured by the way her body curves or doesn't curve. 
by where she is flat or straight or round. She is measured by 36, 24, 36, and inches and ages and numbers by all the outside things that don't ever add up to who she is on the inside. And so, excuse me. And so if a woman is to be measured, let her be measured by the things she can control, by who she is and who she's trying to become, because as every woman knows, measurements are only statistics, and statistics lie. This is an ad for Nike women's aerobic shoes. Basically, Nike has taken two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber and made it stand for efficacy and power and liberation. Nike does not say to women, you give me $100, I will give you two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber manufactured in the Far East under somewhat suspicious conditions. Okay? That's not the pitch for Nike women's aerobic shoes. Nike has turned two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber into something that has meaning. Step one in great innovation is to make meaning. Step two is to make a mantra. A mantra is a two or three word description of why your product, your service, or your organization should exist. It is not a 50 word explanation. This is a mission statement. This is a mission statement for Wendy's, a fast food restaurant in America. The mission of Wendy's is to deliver superior quality products and services for our customers and communities through leadership, innovation, and partnerships. This is a fast food restaurant. In all the times that I have ordered hamburgers and french fries and Cokes in Wendy's, or I have driven through Wendy's to order hamburgers, french fries, and Cokes, in all those times, it has never occurred to me that I am participating in leadership, innovation, and partnerships. I don't think any Wendy's employee can repeat this mission statement. Not even the founder of Wendy's could repeat this mission statement. I know he cannot. He's dead. The point here is that these kinds of mission statements are too long and not memorable. They try to serve too many purposes. I don't know if you make mission statements for your organizations here, but in America, let me tell you what we do. We have a two-day off-site. This off-site gathers the top management of the company. The off-site is usually held at a hotel with a world-class golf course. There's very high correlation, golf and mission statement. You take the top 50 or so people from the company and you put them in this hotel together. Then you hire an outside meeting facilitator to help you make the meeting flow. This... This, well, that helps the slides. Thank you. <laughs> I knew there was a solution. So this outside meeting facil facilitator's job is to make the meeting flow better. The first day, you form cross-functional teams within this group. So basically, you're forming teams with the people at the company you cannot stand. You climb ropes together. You fall into each other's arms. You build this feeling of trust and kumbaya and affection for the people you cannot really stand. The next day, you are in a room, you have a piece of paper and a big pen, and you craft the mission statement. This mission statement is going to be good for the employees, the shareholders, the customers, and if you're in California, it also has to be good for the whales and the dolphins. <laughs> 